We start with our stories now with direct focus on health. And as Ghana joins the rest of the world in marking Malaria Day, the country has made some significant strides. Now, malaria prevalence reduced from 50% in 2002 to 20.4% last year. This means Ghana is no more hyper epidemic for malaria. Health experts are attributing the success rate to the use of insecticide-treated net and indoor residual spraying. Currently, severe malaria admissions have reduced. The death rate has significantly declined, with under five malaria fatality dropping from 14.4 in 2000 to 0 0.32 last year. Malaria-related death in all ages has also seen a decline from 3,882 in 2010 to 2,264 last year. More so, over 78% of pregnant women have resulted to using the treated net, reducing the infection rate. Ghana is no longer high pandemic for malaria. We've made all this progress. Does it mean it's been smooth sailing? No. There have been challenges and there are still challenges. The challenge is still to do with the resistance and the use of the nets. Even though we've shown, and everywhere, the whole world shows that if you use the nets, it can be prevented from getting malaria. Still, there are people who do not want to use it. From next year, Ghana will join Malawi and Kenya to take part in the WHO coordinated pilot program for malaria vaccine, which has gone through more than 20 years of testing. A serious obligation remains ahead of us all to save the unfortunate people who die of this preventable and treatable disease. Speaking at the launch of the Ghana Malaria Foundation to commemorate World Malaria Day, which falls on April 25, the Deputy Director of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Gloria Kansa, lauded partners for contributing to Ghana's success story. First Lady Rebecca Kufuado called for private sector support to close the funding gap. By investing in the fight against malaria, you'll be exercising your power to stop deaths due to malaria. At the same time, your investments will generate real returns as it will be a key driver of business growth. World Malaria Day is an international observance commemorated every year on April 25 and recognizes global efforts to control the disease. And we're still staying on health. Meanwhile, the world's first vaccine against malaria will be introduced in Ghana, Kenya, and Malawi next year. Program manager of the National Malaria Control Program, that's Dr. Constance Batplanche, has welcomed the move. The RTSS vaccine trains the immune system to attack the malaria parasites, which is spread by mosquito bites. The World Health Organization said the jab had the potential to save tens of thousands of lives. But it is not yet clear if it will be feasible to use in the poorest parts of the world. The vaccine needs to be given four times, once a month for three months, and then a fourth dose 18 months later. This has been achieved in tightly controlled and well-funded clinical trials. But it is not yet clear if it can be done with the real world, where access to health care is limited. The World Health Organization is running pilots in three countries to see if a full malaria vaccine program could be started. When we say pilot, it means that there are some regions in Ghana where the malaria vaccine will be administered to children. And with malaria vaccine coming on board, it means that more progress is going to be made. So we are selecting some places in Ghana to pilot it. And when we have finished, it will go nationwide. It will also continue to assess the safety and effectiveness of the vaccination. Dr. Matishido Moeti, the WHO Regional Director for Africa, said the prospect of a malaria vaccine is great news. The pilot will involve more than 750,000 children aged between 5 and 17 months. Around half will get the vaccine in order to compare the jab's real-world effectiveness. 
In this age group, the four doses have been shown to prevent nearly four in ten cases of malaria. This is much lower than approved vaccines for other conditions. It also cuts the most severe cases by a third and reduces the number of children needing hospital treatment or blood transfusions. But the benefits fall off significantly without the crucial fourth dose. Each country will decide how to run the vaccination pilots, but high-risk areas are likely to be prioritized. And we're still staying on health. We have some statistics on malaria eradication. Yes, the news is that Ghana has made some gains in tackling this very problem that has to do with malaria cases. But let's look at what we have so far. Ghana recorded about 10 million cases of malaria in 2015, contributing 38.1 OPD cases and lives saved from malaria are estimated to account for 20% of all progress in reducing child mortality in sub-Saharan Africa since the year 2000. And still more on malaria this afternoon, 94,000 newborn deaths from 2009 and um, 2012 averted. So some good news there. That's 94,000 newborn deaths have been averted from 2009 to 2012. And 90% of reduction in malaria incidents and mortality rates by 2030, as stated by the WHO. So these are some of the statistics we have for you on malaria. What has been done so far in relation to eradication here in our country, Ghana. But Briefly, I do have in the studio a representative from the Malaria Control Program. She is um, in the person of the Deputy Program Manager for the National Malaria Control Program. That's Dr. Kezia Mom. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And thanks for your time this afternoon. Thank you for having now, me. Some success is chalked since the year 2002. We are seeing about 20.4% last year. How did we go about this? Yeah, um, thank you very much once again for having me on your show. Indeed, we have chalked some successes in reducing the deaths and um, the prevalence of malaria. These were efforts that we all put together to achieve. So you realize that we had interventions that was aimed at <laughs> preventing people from getting malaria. And these interventions included uh, the use of ITNs, the use of indoor residual spraying. For pregnant women, we promoted the use of SP as a preventive medication after the first three months of their pregnancy. Mm. Um, there was also the introduction of the seasonal malaria chemo prevention, which was used for children under five in Upper West and just last year in Upper East as well. So we, we treat them during the high transmission season so they don't get the malaria and the parasites within them are cleared to reduce transmission. So a number of interventions, all these together have come together okay. to help us achieve what we, we have achieved. You know, still in achieving this, there are some challenges. For instance, some few minutes ago, Dr. Constance Batplanche, that's the program manager for the Malaria Control Program, stated that there's still difficulties with people using the mosquito treated nets is it mm. that they still don't understand um, why they should use it I, I it is a challenge in the sense that if you look at the statistics that came we are not hundred percent in fact our target was to get at least 80 percent of the population sleeping under the net because um, there's evidence to show that when 80 percent of the population are using the net mm. even other people who are not using the net benefit people are not sleeping in the nets, and there are a myriad of reasons for that. Some people complain that it's hot to sleep in the nets. Some people complain they are just not comfortable. They feel like they are sleeping in a coffin. But what we always say is, once you start using it, you get used to it, to the extent that even when you don't sleep in it, you feel uncomfortable. And if you realize the season that we have the highest malaria transmission, it's much cooler. Mm -hmm. So. At least it, during that high malaria transmission season, we encourage people to sleep, sleep in it. So we'll not stop the fight, we'll continue mm. to create the awareness for people to sleep yes. in it. Yes, again, we've made some gains, but malaria is still the leading cases recorded at OPDs. Yes. Is that the case? 
We have made gains, like I said, in deaths, in actual prevalence of the parasites in the blood of children. What is happening in our OPDs is that malaria still continues to top because most of the cases that we see in the OPDs are not tested to be confirmed as malaria before they are recorded as malaria. They are still recorded as suspected malaria and treated because we've come from the age where every fever is equal to malaria. Mm -hmm. So, but it's getting better. We are hopeful that with time, we'll get to a point where we are only going to record, confirm that is tested and proven as positive um, cases mm -hmm. as malaria. And um, the good news about the vaccines, Ghana is one of the three countries that have been selected. And any time the issue about vaccines come up, there are some concerns, side effects, which people will be tested. What happens? Is it for free? Would they be paid when they're being used for that test? How is this? Well, how would you go about it as a department? Yes, you are right. I mean, people are always concerned when it's um, a new Even vaccine being, 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 when, being when it tested. Mm. That's why we started the education mm. now. Um, this vaccine that is going to be piloted in Ghana has been in trial stage and tested for the past 20 years. So it's, it's been long studied. Even in Ghana, we actually tried it in two sites in Ghana. So it's not new to the Ghana terrain. Just that what we are going to do now is to try it in a normal immunization setting okay. to see how effective it is. So we've tried it in children in Ghana in certain sites. Already? Under, yes, under About clinical trials okay. where everything is um, well studied and we have seen the effectiveness and the efficacy. What WHO is recommending is that now let's take it to the normal setting where children come for uh, EPI immunization. Let's see how effective it is and under that setting. And what was the percentage when you did the first yes. round? About how many, if you do have a figures, how many children were tested? So for, I wouldn't be able to tell okay. you the total number of children who were tested off my head. But for children five to seven months, what we saw was that I was able to, present, to prevent about 40% of clinical malaria cases. Okay. For severe malaria, depending on the age, it was between 30 and 50%. And for malaria control, that is a good gain because malaria control doesn't depend on one bullet. It's a number of interventions we put together. So if we have one intervention that is reducing this much, we believe once we add it to the other interventions, it's going to save a lot of lives. All right, then. Thank you so much for your time. This afternoon, I have been speaking with the Deputy Program Manager for the National Malaria Control Program, Dr. Kezia Momin. We're looking at the World Malaria Day. But away from that story, let's move on to some others. And the president of the Ghana National Canoe and Fishermen Association, Ni Abu Trekwanda, has asked government to deliver on promise to construct a fishing harbor for fisher folks at Jamestown in Accra. He expressed disappointment over failed promises by past governments. Jamestown, a popular coastal community, lies alongside other densely populated communities like Choko and Bukom. The main economic activity here is fishing. The proposal for the construction of a fishing harbor for fisher folks started long ago. In 2004, former President Kufu cut the sword for the construction of the harbor, but it never came to fruition. The proposed harbor was also in the late Professor Atamil's budget and was echoed in President Mohammed's tenure. On Sunday, April 23, President Kufuado reassured the chiefs and people of Jamestown of plans to construct the new harbor for Jamestown. Showing a proposed design which is currently at the Ministry of Fisheries, the president of the Ghana National Canoe and Fishermen Association, Ne Abeo Chirekwanda, tags the current MPP administration to deliver on its promise as past governments have failed in executing the project. If we really want to continue to regard Ghana as a fishing country, or a country in which the fishing industry plays an important part, then the question of building uh, fishing harbors at strategic places still stands as a very important thing. Again, Nia Biochirekwanda asked government to tackle all unauthorized fishing methods, which is depleting fish stock. 
while we are thinking about constructing a fishing harbor here, we should also think about what to do to stop the activities of these uh, miscreants and actually take fair measures to deal with them and make sure that the fish stocks are restored. Now from fishing, we move to farming, and the Ghana Cocoa Board has stepped in to provide support for farmers affected by armyworm infestation in the Shanti region. The Cocoa Health Extension Division presented several boxes of insecticide to affected cocoa farmers to control the pest. Here's a report by Ibrahim Abubakar. Following a report on the plight of farmers in 25 cocoa growing communities within the Ejisu Drabing Amampo municipalities, help has come. The farmers were on the verge of losing their investments to the invasion of army worms. The pairs have within two days destroyed over 30 acres of cocoa farms in the affected communities. The pests moved from one farm to the other despite the application of insecticides to control them. The Mampong Cocoa Health Extension Division of Cocoa Board has stepped in to rescue affected cocoa farmers. On Monday, the division supplied free insecticides to 15 out of the 25 affected communities to control the pests. Mampong District Extension Coordinator of CHED, Bishop Bwachi, says the insecticides are effective in the control of army worms. We came here with a katemata from Cocoa Board then to give to the farmers so that they can spray. We even added them premise. The farmers who are having machines, but when they can find that petition, looking at the extent of the uh, vaccination, you have to help them with it. So we come to with some uh, motorized machines and add to what they are having. Some affected farmers commended TV3 for prompting the swift response from authorities with the hope the insecticides will help them recoup some of their losses. Mrs. Bridges Boache advised the farmers to report any unusual pest invasion on their farms to the district agric office. The second batch of insecticide distribution to the remaining 10 affected communities is expected to continue. Let's go on of our headline stories and the officials of the Bank of Ghana are already before the Public Accounts Committee of Parliament as public hearings on the 2015 Auditor General's report and that has currently begun. The committee will be interrogating reports covering the central bank's foreign exchange receipts and payments for the year in 2015. So my colleague Evelyn Tingma is currently there and she is joining us for some updates. Over to you, Evelyn. From the Bank of Ghana, um, currently before the committee, and they are looking at the report of the Auditor General on the statement of foreign exchange receipts and payment of the Bank of Ghana for the first and second half year ended 30th June 2015. And so we have the Deputy Governor, um, Dr. Johnson Esiama, leading the officials for this particular exercise. And before the exercise began, some members wanted to find out why the deputy or the governor himself wasn't available but the chairman explained that the governor is in Washington attending the spring meeting over there and so it was right and appropriate for the deputy governor to represent them here and so currently they are before the committee and they have been answering several questions and one of the questions um, that they have been um, answering or talking about and some members wanted to find out why Newmont Ghana why Newmont Ghana has retained 100% of its retention and well so um, the officials did explain that government um, has well that was beyond them the governor did explain that that actually was beyond them and so um, they cannot explain that and um, also we have um, some concerns that were raised by some members of the committee and that um, the issue that was that the country was expected to get 50 million um, dollars from the bauxite and um, but as we speak um, the Ghana receipts that was accrued was only nine million dollars and so um, members wanted to find out why and such a thing but what the governor did explain or the deputy governor did explain was that um, normally um, the 
companies or the, the mining firms will project what they are going to receive each year. And so before the year begins, the, the, the firms will then um, tell them what their projections are. But at the end of it all, we do not have those um, receipts or those projections being made. And that was the reason or the explanation that was given by the governor um, the deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana. And so uh, we also have um, one of the members, Afenio Marking, he also raised an issue that, um, that a company that he knows, that um, a bauxite company actually, that it is called Ghana Bauxite Company Limited, exported um, 40,000 tons of bauxite abroad in 2015. But um, that has not been captured in the report that is currently being discussed. But the deputy governor said that um, they should be giving time to cross-check and get back to the committee as um, they will not have the information right now as to why that is the reason. And so um, basically, Wendy, these are some of the um, issues that the... Uh, committee has been asking members of um, the officials from the Bank of Ghana. And so, um, Wendy, we will bring you up to speed any other development. Of course, we will be talking to some other members of the committee because, I mean, this is not the first time that a public accounts committee is uh, sitting on this uh, matter. I mean, every now and then we have the committee um, asking officials of various ministries and departments and other agencies, um, and we have seen how officials of these institutions have squandered money, have misappropriated funds, and yet they are made to go um, uh, not prosecuted, unprosecuted. And so um, these are some of the questions. We have asked them before, why these people who are found to be misappropriating public funds are not prosecuted. But well, they have always said that, I mean, theirs is to find out, fish out, and then let the public know. And then the appropriate bodies will also take up some of these issues. But as we speak, um, it's still going on. We haven't heard anyone being prosecuted in that regard. And so we will try to seek answers from members of the committee. I mean, this is a new parliament, and we have um, new members of the committee. So we will also be finding out from them what other reasons or what other measures they are or that they will be taking in curbing some of these uh, situations. So Wendy, if this um, officials from the Bank of Ghana, when they are done, they will also consider the reports of the Auditor General on the statement of foreign exchange receipts and payments of the Bank of Ghana for the half year ended 31st December 2015. So that will be after officials of the Bank of Ghana. So we'll bring you up to speed the development from the Parliament House here. And so um, my name is Evelyn Tinkma. Back to you in the studio, Wendy. Thank you very much indeed, Evelyn, for that update. We'll get back to you as and when you do have some more updates from us from the floor of Parliament and then also from the Public Accounts Committee. You're still watching. Media Live. Let's look at some other stories. And more than 100 members of ICU, including its General Secretary Solomon Kote, nearly turned away after being met with heavy stench at the Pantang Hospital. Now, the members who had gone to the premises to present some assorted items felt disappointed and insisted on pushing the ministries of health and environment to ensure decent workplace for the staff of the hospital. Numbering more than 100, the members of the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union converged at Presec Legum to present their items. They brandished placards and moved through the streets to present their assorted items to the Pantan Hospital. However, upon arriving at the hospital, the members were greeted with this deplorable road at the main entrance of the hospital. They again felt a strong stench emanating from the dump site closely located around the Pantan Hospital. This nearly forced the team, including the General Secretary, Solomon Kote, to stop the presentation. Sit for about five minutes, it welcomes you. It gets you feel nauseated, and if you don't take care, you can even throw out. It's that bad. So what will you be doing as a national union? 
Well, we have indicated already we will get to the Adenta municipality and then try to see whether we can even link the AM, even though it is not in that jurisdiction, because it's a major task that we think they need to uh, join forces to get it you know, cleared or get a safety way of actually managing this uh, fuse. A senior medical director at the hospital, Dr. Livian Jima, felt frustrated about the stench. We are happy that ICU has also experienced it through the visit and have made appeals to the powers that be to at least take a second look at it and see how best to improve. Either there will be a recycling plant that will overtake the activities of the uh, refuse dump so that the hazards that come with it will not be experienced by the residents around this locality. Meanwhile, one major concern to the management of the hospital is the inadequate subvention to manage the hospital. In 2016, the Pantan Hospital received 180,000 cities, while in 2017, the hospital has received 380,000 cities. Of major concern to them is a delay in the passage of the airline on mental health. The hospital again complained about encroachment and the poor road network in its premises. Later, the disappointed members of ICU presented their assorted items worth 10,000 cities, including 200 bears to the hospital. We are even planning to adopt a, a ward so that every year we will come and then make sure that uh, the things that they need we are able to uh, supply. In a related development, the hospital organized a health screening to check the blood pressure and eyesight of the members. Let's look at one of our headline stories now. And some aggrieved artisanal miners in the Ashanti region intend to petition the Asantehino Tumfose to the second over government's move to halt their operations. Now, yes, their group of the miners met with the Amansia West District Assembly to petition the MP for Manson Kwanta. William Evans Inkum, our correspondent there, joins us shortly to give us some more updates on what exactly is happening, what their concerns are, how best they intend to deal with the problem, and what they want to see done regarding Galamse operations. So, over to you, William Zinko. Of the Constitution, 184. When you go to 183, you're talking about other functions of the Bank of Ghana in terms of encouraging and promoting economic development and blah, 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 which is outside what we are doing now. What we are doing now is limited to 184. Thank you. Yes, Mubarak. Yes. Briefly. I the <laughs> But a very positive side, side a boa Ghana for population. I won't mind you, Muno, and yet in the packet. Who consider the linkage are mine and the map productivity of Ghana and yet at the Ketua? Your best rare a bino and need the ammonia home brassium and yon toqua. Say, say, a woman, you soon 
because Ghana for near sea and hot tree. You want to hear him and yet to a bar, a ma, a nanco for a do, and then a limpen you for a bite. So a mum ran or how I woman no me in free. And tea for one month near the beer gallam say gallam say, and no quane Ghana for problem, and I ye busa. And I summoned the honor, so no. O be a name say MPP for dear, or more young woman name for. Ye, ye, a nominee, a ye, a minister, snake account. Who we do a more profile, sir? Who name say woman name for? Ah, approach to problems, you know. It shouldn't go that far. It shouldn't create create uh, fear and panic. Sir, a bar no, a ye crado. So on, on course, so unemployment, dear. And you won't have but Tremma, yes, most K minus. When you need in Kitaho, because I a crowd on Susie a Bebois a bino. You move be your free, your current, your co free excavators. You move be your churchia, a ye adjigi alliances. Or mobile bontia, or moon statino, or moon uncreated dimensional. At the other enough for you, you be bra, you invest a lot of dollars into this business. As I know a hard one. Into your whole home. Na MPP aba meji ani a se ihu ani how mum no mosande ebre na se be se dia se dia te how mum ni asinye na se o how fufu ne ba ni ana ke etne ebe bi ye nko ni sa yinim se na na ku fu ado we di politics e chiache unim the in and out of Ghana maybe we jide ma pa o na na ku fu ado ye best sre na aba no so o munya abotre o mo ma ye mre ya nu mu nyina be carbon en ne obi o yes most key mining e wo ashanti region wa habi ye be to ato adwene na ye ni ayaboa o mo o motin su su o mo o mo ye ni ma enfa afeti nyina no ye be identify wo mo ye be boa ye su ye be yiska boa man no aban no what the task force i i i get to read of all the bad not on e wo mining ejume no but she say said o mo kanu no as a mining no kura no Ghana by any the M Peninsula. But Ghana by Peninsula. Oak Family Minerals Commission Law or Ho. A state clearing. A war. Just more scale mine. Went in a Minerals Commission where you go through documentation. Near the lines is a coyed man. But they say, or how I bet you so. You're near your term excavator payment. They say a packing machine. Utria necker two months grand went to me to a company in Babefa. Into a how we na abaino de bre. Ye best sir abaino. Ye ye ready to see a bebko pretty. Mo on fun hunu hunu anfa suja sem. The last time I operation ba Ghana, I know the day I'm running down. Se bin komu koye, ni esu wa mena wotu ni. Katasu ansa, ya fa amashi na kwa anka amene biya nao. Into umu nyambo, tre no montina se deyese proper way on biti me handle the situation. En na enye se de biya na ye duya ni si, ya no ne ye ri wa Ghana. A bre a Ghana fo, e wo problems be bre an, ane akufo do bon ton, or can ye one district one for anti side issues in a ira and a nina a concentrate to a galam se huana? Yes, sir, my bane ya me a dia or be or tea be a dia when I come on. We are bleeding in our heart. And you can say, Cosa, the Omobetia Handono District Assembly, no, they had a task force that they know every minor site of what a district be a. Ah, Omoko, it is Omokromo assigned one, they can get rid of the bad ones. Omo, we had it, and young Nuna said the beer, no multimedia, so no moon, and Yanu Kwasun. So you just had representatives of small scale miners who are going to see the Sartain or Tumfo or Sertu to also air their concerns about their intent position to him over government's move to halt. Um, that's Galamse operations, the small scale mining as well. And he also mentioned how they have been affected and is calling on government to hasten slowly. He also mentioned that they are willing to support governments to fish out those illegal miners. So we'll bring you some more on that very story in our subsequent bulletins. You're still watching Media Live. Now, two Guinean suspects are in the grips of the Bachuna Divisional Police for allegedly murdering a 50-year-old Chinese engineer. The suspects also made away with some items belonging to the deceased. Commander of the Bachuna Divisional Police, Chief Superintendent Felix Cosmos, told the media the suspects, Eko Kosa, 23, and Michael Mensa, 22, were employees of the deceased Ren Guanfa on Wednesday, April 12, 
went to the Sakumono residence of the deceased under the guise of going to draw water from his reservoir. The suspects allegedly attacked and beat the Chinese national till he became unconscious and finally strangulated him to death. The police further said the suspects made away with two Huawei mobile phones, a desktop computer and a bag containing the personal effects of the deceased. On April 16, Eko Kosa was arrested but denied knowledge about the offense. He later confessed to the crime after the deceased person's phone was retrieved from his room at Lashibi off the Spintex Road. He mentioned Michael Mensa as his accomplice who was subsequently arrested on April 20 at his hideout at Teshi. Michael Mensa led the police to his hometown, Ekumfi Accra, in the central region to retrieve the stolen items. The suspects are being arraigned before court while the body of the deceased has been deposited at the police hospital mortuary. Thanks for staying. Time now for business. And the founder managing partner of Nubuke Investments, Tutu Ejari, has reiterated the need to create a fair balance between employers and employees in dealing with the issue of unemployment in Ghana. He was speaking to TV3's Parkway Siasari on time with the captains. There's not enough being done by the colleges to prepare the students for the real world, to prepare them to be able to, you know, ultimately it's not what you've learned, it's what the employer wants. And matching up those two is where the real challenge lies, the extent to which there are employers out there who are looking for people. The third edition of TV3's business from Time with the Captains came off with students and some industry players being schooled on how to build a successful career, utilizing skills acquired through education without waiting to be employed. One of the most important things is that the state isn't going to be able to employ everybody. So I think anybody coming out of the graduate system at the moment has got to have one eye on having to work for themselves and building a career around themselves. Founder and managing partner of Nubuki Investments, Tutu Ajari, said government ought to structure the economy in order to facilitate private sector development and create space for private businesses to operate. Adding, issues of high interest rates ought to be properly addressed to promote businesses. Some of the issues that surround investments is the fact that we have such a high interest bill. If you can reshape um, your debt profile and bring some certainty and reduce the rates to it, you create the space to allow the private sector to come in and borrow. He also emphasized the need to make use of opportunities within the agricultural sector towards job creation. The one-hour live show, which is broadcast once every month, is expected to imbibe in the youth the spirit of entrepreneurship by giving them an opportunity to hear the success stories of successful people. Let's go some more. And the Teachers and Education Workers Union, TEO, have employed traditional rulers to release land to support government's planting for food and jobs program. Its General Secretary, Augustine Cabo, requested TEU members to buy into the program when it's rolled out. The planting for food and jobs policy is expected to create 750,000 jobs nationwide. So far, 125 million Canadian dollars has been secured by government to commence the program. The Teachers and Education Workers Union, TEU, lauded government for the bold initiative. Its General Secretary, Augustine Cabo, called on TEU members to buy into the policy and begin to invest in it. There should be a time scale, and it's not using working hours to do some of these things. Mm. It's to use their working hours for work and break time or weekends, Saturday, Sunday, and public holidays can be used for this work so that they can really get involved in it. Augustine Cabo again encouraged chiefs to release lands for the project. All chiefs and families who own bulk lands, they should be willing to release some of these lands for agriculture where some of our members can e equally get involved in to benefit. Some critics have argued lack of markets and post-harvest losses could affect the program. Government responded to the critics who argued lack of ready markets could result in post-harvest losses by earmarking the construction of 1,000 warehouses. Other critics are of the view that 1,000 warehouses cannot be constructed, but the Tell General Secretary disagrees. The critics, yes, they have a point, but it doesn't mean it cannot be done. 
I believe strongly that if we all rally behind with the good spirit that the government is, is, is um, coming out with this policy, this will succeed and Ghana will be the winner at the end of the day. That's all for business this afternoon. We have sports next. Good afternoon. Welcome back to Midday Live here on TV3. My name is Anako Jaffrey with the sports update for you. Let's get into the details now. And the current sponsorship deal between the Ghana National Petroleum Corporation and the Black Stars will be amended to take care of other sporting needs in the country. Sports Minister Isaac Atiyama says while reports that the deal has been cancelled, they are seeking to channel the sponsorship through the ministry and other for other sports and disciplines to benefit. The GMPC deal will continue. The support for the national team will continue. There's that all that this time um, place much emphasis on will be greater transparency and accountability in the use of our own oil money, ensure that there's proper oversight by the Ministry of Youth and Sports. So now, the amount to be channeled through the Ministry of Youth and Sports is no longer going to go through the GFE. The Ministry will take charge, full responsibility, so that the Minister, whoever is here, would report to Parliament, people's representatives, on the use of the funds. So instead of that direct link of the GFE, no, it will come to the Ministry of Youth and Sports for disbursement to the senior national team. It will also enable the ministry to also support other sporting disciplines. That is sense why we are bringing it here. The ministry will have its own priorities so that by the allocation that we get from GMPC or from the Ministry of Energy, part of it could also be used to support the other sporting disciplines. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Youth and Sports says government will back the former Black Stars captain Chris Yapia fully in his new role as Black Stars coach. You can be assured the fullest support from the government of His Excellency President Ekufuad. We are going to give you all the support that you need to succeed. Ghanaians love football and we demand nothing but victory. We pray that good Lord will reward your efforts with nothing but success. I employ you, the new national coach, to be very assertive, be fair and firm in your selection of players. Help to improve our local league. You should stay focused on your job and because your vision should be clear to make the blasters greater than you have come to meet it. Bring back the support of Ghanaians. Now, Ghanaians are not so much enthused when they hear of our senior national team, the Black Stars. Coach Kosia Pia, you are supposed to also ensure that our supporters are happy once again. On behalf of the president, we wish the new coach well. We expect nothing but success from our new coach. It is a common tale about life after football. Often, when the whistle stops and the cheers die down, those unprepared for it are found desperately wanting. Dora Bedue Champon has the tale of one of such players who is hoping his story will sound the alarm bells to the latest generation of high earning players. In his prime, Abu Imoro was a midfield dynamo capable of breaking up play and creating chances with equal elegance. He was so good, they nicknamed him after the French great Jenny Tagana. He was tough tireless and technically tremendous but those unfilled qualities which made him a beauty to behold doesn't seem to have guided him off it or in life after football in his own words his entire career earnings has been blown away on drugs now the former rtu and black stars midfielder is forced to survive on the hangout of others i sometimes go to abedi he will receive me well then he will give me transportation so i'm expecting them to help me a lot even if a little self, I can force myself to come up. Abu Moro, you see here with me, yes, was my senior in the national team that we had to take a lot of lessons from. Uh, in those days, he was a champion in his own class. He's a real role model. But let us look at, look, look at only the negatives. What he has gotten into, if others get themselves into it, this is how they will end up, if not worse. We're still trying. We still want to get him out of the, uh, this situation. 
while Imoro doesn't earn anything close to what present day's players pocket, he says they are as vulnerable to the traps as anyone else. He desperately hopes telling his story will help many others avoid the same mistakes. When I went into drugs, I regretted it very much. I would advise them not to go near drugs because they are youth, they are now coming up. And if you want to play, don't move to drugs. Keep yourself out. In this afternoon, we focus on talented kids. Uh, DJ prodigy Erica Tando, a.k.a. DJ Swish, has been magical on the turntable and sees talented kids as a learning curve. The rising star is upbeat about her chances at the finals on May 7. She's only nine years, but her powers on the turntable is one that goes beyond imagination. Her art is one of the few unique ones which grace this year's edition of Talented Kids. Known as DJ Switch, Erica Tando was selected at the Takwadi audition and the rest has just been fireworks. <laughs> Erica has been consistent with her selection of songs, mixes, and her flow through performances as well as getting audience involvement in her acts. She has won four awards to her credit on the show, three times the best creative arts and one time star performer. DJ Switch has her eye on the ultimate and won't stop at anything to emerge winner. Enter kids is not easy, but with hard work, I'm in the finals. I'm very happy, and that tells me that I have to work hard and train hard. I have to do whatever they ask me to do so that I can win the competition. With the ambition of becoming a medical doctor, Erica hopes to save lives, but it will also not stop her from pursuing her passion in DJing. For her, the show has been challenging, but also worth every bit of it. And welcome to Tata Walk and Tata with your one and only DJ Switch. Tonight we are going to look at the difference between musicians of independence era and musicians of today. Her trainer, Tavia Evans, said the finale will be full of surprises. He also added that Erica had been amazing and it was easy working with her. Uh, Switch is a kind of um, a child that is trainable. Everybody would love to uh, work with her when it comes to memorizing lines. Sometimes some of the things he says on air, we give it to her like five minutes to stage and she will just memorize it and come in and, and deliver. So. Will this year's title go to the West? May 7, 2017 will be the deciding factor. And of course, the time Satawale was called. <laughs> She's indeed a star and she's born with it. But next we have some creators from Tilapia. So for more from Tilapia, you can check our website, that's 3news.com. That'll be all for this afternoon.